The Bar Star Podcast is a show full of stories, opinions, and sarcasm. Hosted by a working musician based in Louisville, Kentucky. Wait a second. This guy knows he's a drummer, right? Not an actual musician? Why would anybody want to... Never mind. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another, finally, new, after three months. I know, I know. Shut it. I'll explain it in a second. Episode of the Bar Star Podcast. I am your host, Stephen O'Reilly. And let me be the first to say, Merry Day After Christmas. If you're listening to this on post day, which is December 26th. 2019. I do realize I have not posted a show since September or something like that. Somewhere in that area. I do apologize. Uh, it is not for lack of trying nor lack of wanting to. It is literally lack of time. Uh, working two jobs and all that kind of shit and some behind the scenes stuff that I can't talk about. Nothing bad, everything is fine, everything's hunky-dory, don't worry. I just have literally not had the time. But I do have a final episode for the year. I could not go the rest of the year and not post one more episode. Uh, But before we get into this episode, I want to thank you guys for continuing to support me. I check the numbers weekly. Uh, You guys are still downloading shows. Some people are still finding the show, and that is amazing, and that makes me happy. Thank you for not forgetting about me. I told you once or twice when all this shit kind of started with me not having or not being able to do a show every week. I told you that the show is not going anywhere. Uh, It is still not going anywhere. So just have to bear with me until I can get on a more regular, regularly scheduled program. It's actually program, but some people say program and I'm not, I don't really know why. Bugs the fuck out of me. Anyway, thank you for checking out this episode. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for continuing to follow me. And if you stopped following me, well, fuck off. You'll never hear that because you don't listen to the show anymore. So today's episode is uh, sponsor-free. I don't really have any sponsors anymore. Completely my fault because I have not posted anything in a while. And I no longer have a website. Uh, The website is gone. And before I can... Mentally hear your collective, ah, uh, you guys weren't really fucking going to it anyway. So it's not really that big of a deal. So to get past episodes, if you are not caught up, which hopefully you are by now because I haven't posted anything in three months, you can go to any podcast platform, wherever you get your podcast, iTunes or Apple Podcast now, I guess, because they made the switch, Spotify, Stitcher, CastBox, Uh, I think I'm on Google Play and, of course, Podbean, which is my home. That is where I post everything from. So now that all that shit is out of the way, today on my episode, I hang out with my buddy, Steve Owens, from the Fascination Street Podcast. Now, he's been on the show before and I've been on his show, so it's kind of a return of, but I call it fascinating bullshit because he took over my show. Because he's an asshole. I love him. And he's my asshole. But he's an asshole. Um, He had a lot of questions about the Delana tour. He kind of felt slighted that when the tour was over, I didn't really talk about it. Uh, I gave a very vague, oh my God, I had such a great time. And it was so fantastic episode about it. And he had a bunch of questions. So we Skyped each other. Because as some of you know, he is in Texas. I am in Louisville. And he just kind of took over my show and asked a bunch of questions. And at first, he annoyed the fuck out of me. But by the time we got done with the episode, it was awesome. I'm glad he did it. I'm glad he made me do it. I'm glad he held me accountable to give some more information and to answer some of his questions. Because they were were good questions. Uh, He's a good dude. If you haven't checked out his show yet, it's Fascination Street Podcast. Uh, You need to go check it out. And that's really it. There's, uh, There's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, The next Swerve show will be January 18th at Baxter's here in Louisville. Um, I'm really proud of 
the shit that we have done so far. For those of you that have seen the band, thank you very much. If you have not seen the band, you need to come check it out. Uh, it's it's a good time. We have a lot of fun, and we do some cool shit. So that's really all I got. You'll hear me plug nothing else. You won't hear me talk about my website because it's gone. Thanks. I still got a garage full of t-shirts, motherfuckers. If y'all want one, fucking hit me up. I'll sell you. I'll sell you them shits cheap. I'll sell you them shits real fucking cheap. Uh, but that's it. That's all I got. Uh, keep this opening short. And uh, when I reference the website in this episode, just keep in mind, Steve and I recorded this back in September. Uh, that is how busy I have been. I have not had a chance to sit down and do my normal editing and record the open and the close like I normally do. I have been editing on this thing for a little bit over a month, uh, just kind of sitting down and, and picking it apart when I have time. Uh, that is how busy I am. Again, full disclaimer, that is not a complaint. I am not whining, 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 nor bitching. It is just a fucking fact, kids. So here is my fascinating bullshit conversation with my buddy who likes to take over my show and steamroll me. But don't worry, kids, I got it back in the end. Steve Owens. All right, so I am back via, I can say that word that way, not throughout the nuts, via Skype with my buddy, Steve Owens, who lives in Texas. Um, he wanted to come back on the show because he had some stuff to talk about. Welcome to Fascination Street Podcast, Stephen O'Reilly from the Bar Star Podcast. How you doing, man? You motherfucker. <laughs> 30 seconds in you're gonna take over my show aren't you why yes, the sir. Are, why the fuck are we friends um that's a bold assumption first of all that we are friends. <laughs> Fair enough. all right so Fair uh point. thank you for letting me take over your show steven i have a whole lot of questions that only you can answer and i was hoping that i might be able to take over your show and interview you for your Wait, own show hold up are you seriously taking over my show uh-huh that's how you i roll man you seriously want to come on my show and take over and then ask me questions it's almost like you don't know me how does your wife put up with you well <laughs> that is a long story now that she doesn't travel monday through friday so th there's a that's a work in progress <laughs> <laughs> Now that she's home every week, she's like, fuck, what have I done? She is. She's like, Jesus Christ. Uh, maybe I can find another road job so I can stay married to this idiot. <laughs> hey, so I'm glad you brought up wives. First of all, I want to say happy anniversary. You guys celebrated an anniversary like, uh, I don't know, t a week or two ago? A couple weeks ago, yeah. We've, yeah. Uh, yeah, Stacy and I have been together uh, 11 years. That's fucking fantastic, man. Congratulations. Shanks, I I, I, uh, I do a lot of dishes to make her stay. You don't have to tell me. I do all the goddamn dishes. <laughs> you know, it's really funny. Um, A long time ago, somebody pointed out, and this was probably, oh, my God. So we were married um, 17 years, I think, or something like that. And uh, Damn. about 10 or 12 years ago, somebody pointed out that whenever my wife and I go somewhere, and as we're walking up to any door at all, she just gets to the door and stands there. Good for her. Because she's waiting for me to open it because that is how I have trained her. And this I person know. was like, this person was like, what the fuck is wrong with you? I was like, uh, I'm a goddamn gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> we goddamn gentlemen deal with it. <laughs> I'm a goddamn gentleman. So, uh, uh, back, back to, uh, the wives. I understand that you, maybe a couple of weeks ago, went, it was like, I guess, take your husband to work day. So you got to go hang out with your wife at her job. Um, oh, you talking about when I sat with her for her because she's a 911 operator. That was actually a couple of years ago. Oh. Um, and I don't remember if I've talked about it on my show or not, which I'm not I'm sure whose show this not. is. 
I'm not sure whose show this is because you're taking over my show and it's freaking me out a little bit. Well, either way, you haven't talked about it on your show or my show. And I know that because I've listened to every single episode of the Bar Star podcast because I goddamn love it. Aw, thanks, Pumpkin. Um, I, I'm trying to remember. I guess it was a couple years ago. Uh, she... It wasn't really take your husband to work day, but I do like that. That's kind of funny. Um, we were talking about it, and she said, well, you know you can come sit with me anytime you want and listen in. And I said, really? And she said, yeah. So I went up there, and I sat for probably four hours uh, just listening to calls. And I took the headset off, got my shit, told everyone in that room that they were fucking saints, angels, and heroes, and I left. Uh, and it made me hate people even more than I do it already. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now, seriously, I, said, I mean, people, people call 911 for the dumbest fucking shit. It's, you would be, people would be shocked at the dumb shit that gets called in for 911 as an emergency. Uh, for example, I am not making this up. This is true. I heard it with my own ear bobs. A woman called 911, wanted the police to come to her house because her neighbor came over and stole a taco. I'm sorry, did you say a taco? Yes, a taco. Her neighbor came over and stole a taco? A taco, yes. What, her front what, door what? was open and her neighbor came over and she was like, hey, come on in. And the neighbor came over, picked up a taco, started eating it, said thanks for the taco and left. And the lady called the cops on her. That is the funniest fucking thing ever. I love no, it's, Louisville. It's fucking sad. I mean, it's funny, yes, but it's sad that, first of all, why would you think that you can call 911 over somebody eating one of your tacos? Punch him in the fucking neck and move on about your day. It's just so stupid. But yeah, it's a, it is a thankless job, and my, my wife is a saint. Um. No she's doubt. also married me, which well, is no fucking picnic. That means she's not all that bright. That doesn't say much for her sainthood. That just talks about her intelligence. I will not tell her you said that. Well, the good thing is she'll never hear it because she doesn't listen to your show. <laughs> You're not wrong, sir. I know. My wife the other day, she came in and she goes, Hey, so I was listening to that episode where you interviewed my dad and I was like, that was like the third episode. Aww. Is this the first time you're listening to it? She goes, yeah. I was like, thanks, babe. <laughs> thanks, lovely. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm 165 episodes in, and she just got to number three. Thanks, babe. Well, I, to, to put the uh, shoe on the other foot, there's shit that I don't do for my wife because it just doesn't interest me. I'm like, hey, go do your thing. So. That's weird. Uh, I don't wear those shoes. I do everything for her. I'm mad. That's it. I'm getting a divorce. You heard it here first. Well, you, you can go ahead and do that, but it's going to require you to get your balls out of her purse first. Well, shit. <laughs> Maybe I can ask for the purse in the, in the settlement. <laughs> You're an idiot. I know, right? <laughs> All right, so what else you got? You're gonna you're gonna hit me with a bunch of shit. So let's let's see what you got because this is gonna be fun. That's or, it. That's all I got. Fine. That's the only question. All right, cool, great show. Fuck yeah, off. That's it. Hey, thanks. Thank you, everybody, for uh, <laughs> taking a walk down Fascination Street. And uh... <laughs> <laughs> all you're right, so, so it's so stupid. I'm fucking dumb, right? Okay, fucking so, dumb. I know from listening to your show, and I guess from you know, texting back and forth like fucking tweens. Yeah, um, we do do that. But it's kind of, I just said do-do. Gross. We went, uh, we. <laughs> 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 yes, so we, you Do I me, need to send you a teleprompter, motherfucker? Yes. We went on a tour a couple months ago. A few months ago. It's probably we been did? a long time I did. now. Well, you okay, did. you did. I want to talk about Delana. Now, I know that on your show, you talked about how the whole Delana thing came to be. And you talked a little bit about um, sort of the rehearsal process and getting to know the other guys. But, oh, and then you went on tour and you came back and you just gave like the briefest little synopsis of, 
hey, we went to a couple of places, had a fucking blast. Those people are great. Maybe we'll do it again sometime. And that was kind of all you said. And I had a lot of questions about that trip. So if it's okay with you, (laughs) I'm ready to interrogate the shit out of you. All right, I'll make a deal with you. Because I, I... I planned poorly, and I'm totally not editing this out. Um, I'm going to go fill up my coffee cup, and then you can fire away with your questions. Deal? Oh, okay, cool. Is that a deal? Yeah. All right, I'll be right back. Don't hang up, fucker, because I don't want to start this whole re-recording process over. I will not do that. (laughs) I'll be right back. (laughs) All right, bye. Hello? Hello? Were you talking shit about me the whole time I was gone? Yes. No, I just started asking questions. (laughs) What you said was, I'm going to go get coffee and you can start asking questions. And I was like, all right. (laughs) You're such a fucking douche. Yes. All right. So I know that you went to the Atlanta Institute of Music, uh, a.k.a. AIM. Uh You were like 29 or 30 or something. Yeah, I went late. Now, by that time, you had already been a professional musician for about a dozen years. Uh, if you want to call me professional, sure, but yeah. <laughs> really? Nothing? <laughs> so. <laughs> <clears throat> so what made you decide to go? I mean, by that time you had already been, you know, playing and touring and everything. So what made you decide that that was something that you needed to do? I thought you were asking me about the Delana tour. How'd you go backwards to aim? Why don't you mind your fucking business and answer the goddamn question? That was That's really the only question I have that's not Delana related, so I wanted to go ahead and take care of that. Because um, I'm genuinely curious. Because my dad has been in bands for my entire life, and so right. I grew up with him being in rock and roll bands, and I didn't even... Like, music school was never discussed ever. So right. what, what made you think that to do that um it's not necessary honestly it's really not that interesting and it's and it's unfortunately kind of cliche-ish but i had tried uh so many times to uh the term now we're talking mid 90s early 90s Um, when i was doing all the original stuff and i had done a bunch of records and i i tried to get uh, every band I was inside and all that kind of shit leading up to the early 2000s. And I was in a band that, uh, how it all happened. Here's a short version. I'll kind of, I think I've talked about this on one of my episodes. I don't remember, but I was in a band and at the same, I was in a band called S tribe, which is the, that cool groove theme music that comes in that I talk over on every ep- episode of my show. That's S tribe. That's me playing drums for those of you that forgot. And while we were in S Tribe, we were being looked at by Sony Management, not the label record, uh, the record label, excuse me, easy for me to say, but Sony Management Company. And at the same time, there was another band in Columbia, South Carolina, where we were based out of called Sugar Daddy Superstar. Sugar Daddy Superstar got signed by Columbia Records, and their drummer could not or did not want to go uh, to the next level, couldn't go on tour, whatever the case was. And the singer asked me, if I wanted to join the band because they just got signed. And I said, well, I can't because we're being looked at by um, Sony management. management. Yeah. Sorry. I was looking at something on my computer. ADD. Ooh, shiny. Um, So we were being looked at by Sony and I said, well, I can't, I uh, I appreciate it as much as I want to. And and it's the other part is the cynical side of me is like, yeah, everybody's getting signed. You didn't get signed. That's great. Well, fast forward two months, those motherfuckers are on the radio as crossfade. Um, the label signed them, remastered the record that they did in their basement, uh, which is all true story, and changed their name to Crossfade. So they're on the radio and they're on Ozfest, and I'm still in the band, S Tribe. And then the singer came in to rehearsal one day and said, "I don't want to do this band anymore. I'm moving to Texas." And that's how the fucking band broke up. So of course I got uh, mildly depressed. Joined Where another... in Texas? Do I know him? No, he he moved back to Columbia already. Uh, maybe I want to say maybe San Antonio. That seems to ring a bell. Where are you? I forgot. You're in. Where are you at? I, I'm in San Antonio. That's why it rings a bell. No, 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 no. I remember 
It was a bigger. It was either Austin or San Antonio. I want to say San Antonio because I think his sister still lives there. Anyway, it doesn't matter. No, you don't know him because he wasn't there long. He lived there for like a year and then moved back to Columbia, and he's still in Columbia now. Um, so I joined another band that we had done some some shows with, um, just so I could at least play, and we ended up switching out two or three shows with a band out of Atlanta called Exit Left. Exit Left sounds like a Rush cover band. <laughs> pretty good actually it would be it would be the opposite you could just say exit stage right and fuck with people and they would be so confused um but anyway exit left was a band that we traded shows out so i was in a band called maywater they were an exit left and we went down to atlanta did a couple shows they came to columbia did a couple shows and the singer who ran the band uh really liked what i did on stage liked the way i played and kind of said hey do you want to move to atlanta and be our drummer and i said uh no i can't because i am in a very horrible, horrible financial bind with my ex-wife. We weren't exes at the time yet, but that was the truth. And I wrote about it in the book, which hopefully one day will get published. Um, but it was just, I, I physically and literally couldn't go. So one thing led to another and they just threw, and I'm not exaggerating, they threw a shit ton of money at me. Um, and it was a lot of money. They had a financial backer who was rumored to be a billionaire with a B. I never confirmed it, but I know that they were at least a millionaire. Um, so they paid all my shit. I moved down to Atlanta, didn't have a job for six or eight months. We recorded a full length record open for vertical horizon. We were doing all this cool shit. And then the guitar player and the financial backer split. Um, and he started another band with the financial backer behind him. So, exit left was done it was toast so i had like an eight month gap in employment uh it was hard for me to get a job sad sad story story blah 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 so up to this point in my life i had never watched um episodic television like i never watched tv ever and i came home one night and my ex-wife was on the couch and she said you need to watch this tv show and i said i don't you know i don't fucking watch tv she said i know but you need to watch this show it was a show called House with Hugh Laurie. So I watched it, and I fell in love with it, and I ended up watching the entire series. She had it on DVR, I think, back then. They called it TiVo. We're talking early 2000s. 2002, maybe? 2003? Doesn't matter. 2000, between 2002 and 2003. So I watched the show, and then I ended up watching the whole series that she had on the DVR. And one night about 3 in the morning, because I couldn't sleep, I had a lot of trouble sleeping back then trying to figure out what the fuck I was going to do because I was thinking about quitting music altogether. A commercial for AIM came on and I saw, I watched the commercial and I rewound it and I watched it again and they had a number that you could call and all that kind of shit. And I said, fuck it. That's what I'm going to do. I've done everything my way for 16, 17 years up to that point. However long it'd been 15 years. I don't even know. I said, fuck it. I'm going to go get lessons because I had never had any lessons up to that point. I said, I'm going to go to music school. I don't have a band. Every Thing that I moved to Atlanta for is gone. Uh, so let's try it a different route. So that's how I wound up at AIM. I went and auditioned. Uh, I got in on my playing ability, but I could not get in on my reading ability because I couldn't read music for shit. So I had to take a three week preliminary reading course, which they essentially stuffed about two years worth of reading music into three weeks, which I barely passed that. Um, that was a fucking nightmare. Uh, but I did. I passed it and I got in and then I ended up graduating AIM with uh, uh, 4.0. And I graduated in what degrees in front of me. I just can't see the date. I think I graduated in 2006. Yeah, I graduated in 2006. That's how I wound up at AIM. That's a short story. Well, that's a great answer. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Now, let's talk about Delana. So we already know that uh, we already know how the Delana thing came about. And if mm-hmm. if the listeners don't remember, they can go find it on your podcast because that's a great episode. Are you talking about the, the show I had with her on? Yes, because I yeah. believe that that show, I mean, yeah, that episode, you sort of explained how it came to be that y'all mm-hmm. met and that yep. this tour was going to happen. So go back yeah. and listen to that one. Yeah, it's a BS with Delana, uh, obviously. For those of you that forgot, because some of you have forgot, because I still have shirts in my garage. 
They're taking up space by them. They're half off on the website, by the way. Uh, go to the website, barstarpodcast.com, and go to the archives, which is the, under the episodes tab. And I think it's, uh, I think it was in April is when that episode came out, I believe. But it's BS with Delana. That sounds about right. Um, so besides you, who else was in the band? And besides Delana, too, I guess. Sorry, I was having a malfunction. Uh, my microphone popped up. Can you hear me? No. Asshole. Yeah. So besides Delana and you, who else was in that band? Uh, a gentleman by the name of Steve Sizemore on bass and another gentleman by the name of Ben Noble on guitar, who I also had them on the show, but I guess a month later after the Delana episode. Um, and I don't want to rehash how we all met, but it was all kind of the same deal. She met them at NAM. Five days later at NAM, she met me. Um, and that's how the whole thing kind of started. And then she messaged me on Instagram and the rest is quote history. Nice. Now, how many times did you guys practice together before Delana flew over from Denmark? Mm, I want to say three, three seems right. I think no, four, it was four because I don't, the first one was a, and they, they will say the same thing. It was, it wasn't a complete train wreck, but it was a, it was a mild train wreck. Um, we st- we ended up joking about it, but I think we were all just kind of nervous about meeting each other and had really didn't have any expectations of what was going to happen. So it just it didn't gel very well, and we were all kind of going, "Well, fuck, this is going to blow." And then the second time we got together, we went, "Oh yeah, this is going to be perfect. We're fine." So I, th- I believe it was four. So the first date didn't go that well, but the second date went great. Pretty much. Cool. How many times did you guys practice when once Delana flew over? One day. Really? One time, huh? Yep. She flew in on a Monday. This is a lot of stuff I did not cover on, on my show. That's um, the point. We are on my show now, but you're taking over my show, so it makes me think that it's your Welcome show. Welcome to Fascination Street use... Podcast. Stephen O'Reilly from the Bar Star Podcast. <laughs> <sighs> Stop it. Um, she flew in on a Monday. I went and picked her up, and so we got to spend uh, two or three days together, uh, me, her, and Petra, who is one of her best friends, and our, she was our acting tour manager, and Stacy, and just got to know each other and talk music and talk shop, and it was really cool, and then we rehearsed on Wednesday. Steve and Ben drove up from, they live right outside of Hazard, Kentucky, which is about three hours from here. They drove up on Wednesday. Are they a couple we, of good old boys? Never meaning, no harm? I'm going to pretend you didn't say that. Beats all you ever saw. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Are you done? So they drove up from uh, Hazard. (laughs) Yeah, they drove up from Hazard. um, Were they just a couple of good old boys? God damn you. (laughs) You were sitting in front of me and punch you in the fucking neck. Um, I I think we probably rehearsed for maybe five hours, four or five hours. Um, ran through pretty much the entire set, fixed a couple of trouble spots. She was super happy. We, uh, we all went and got some food and then came back to my place and crashed and we left for the tour on Thursday morning. So the whole band crashed at your house and then y'all just left from there. Mm -hmm. Yep. The whole band plus Petra. Yeah. There's a picture on my Facebook somewhere. Um, and it's on Delana and Petra's Facebook too, where we're all sitting on outside the van or sitting a couple of us are in the van. A couple of us are outside the van. Um, we're all this, like this tight group shot. And that was the morning we left. Oh, cool. So what did you think you were going to get out of this experience? What did I think I was going to get? Yeah. Why'd you do it? What about it appealed to you enough to leave your wife for two months or whatever it was? Oh, it wasn't two months. It was only 10 days. God damn it. Just answer the fucking question. Well, get the fucking question right. If it was two months, I'd still be on the road. Uh Uh-huh. That's what I thought. You got nothing. Um, I love touring. I've not got to do as much as I would like. Um, I've done some in the past. Uh, I've gone out for six weeks. I've gone out for a week. I've gone out for three weeks. Um, I've done a lot of mini runs still under the umbrella of touring, but I love it. And when the opportunity came to not only go on a, on a short tour, uh, but do it with an artist that I'm a fan of, I mean, how the fuck could I say no to that? So it wasn't about the money. It wasn't, oh, I can get my foot in the door and maybe somebody will see me and lead me to the next. I mean, yeah, you always think of that stuff, but that wasn't the main motivator. 
Um, I mean, yeah, I had to make sure that it was financially worthwhile or I just could not do it. And it worked out. It all came out in the wash. I didn't lose money. I didn't make a shit ton of money, but it was never about the money. As long as there was enough money for me to sustain while I was gone, I was happy. But that was the main reason. It was, I love to tour. There's something about going to a place you've never been and setting up all your gear and you have one job to do to make a room full of strangers have a good time through music, obviously. And then you pack up and you go to the next town and you get to do it again. I mean, what the fuck could be better than that? Uh, how many shows did you guys play? Six. Okay. Now in those six, uh, were there any of them in cities or venues that you had not been to before? All of them. Every single one. Yep. Yeah. We went to, uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, Hazelwood, Wisconsin. I've never even been to Wisconsin. Then we did two shows in Canada. Uh, Had you been to Canada before? I had been to Canada when I was a kid, but I don't remember it because um, I'm originally from New York. So we apparently used to go to Canada. I don't. That makes sense. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then we played Cleveland, uh, which I had been to Cleveland before, but I've never played there. And then we played, and the last show was Richmond, Indiana, which is about two, two and a half hours from Louisville. Um, but I had never even heard of Richmond and never heard of this venue. And Richmond is a tiny town. It's small. But this venue is actually kind of legendary. We were in there and uh, in the backstage or upstage, I should call it because, it, because it was upstairs. And there was fucking so many people that had played there. Like, Great White played there and John Karabi played there and Lita Ford played there. And this was all recent, like within the past five years. That was kind of cool. Oh, no shit. Mm-hmm. Um, I think John Karabi is in, I think he's part of Gene Simmons' band when he's not with Kiss. Uh, he might be. I'm I not think. 100% sure. I know he was in the um, the Dead Daisies for a minute, but he's he's not doing that anymore. What either. the fuck are the Dead Daisies? It's a, a sleaze rock band from Australia. Um, and the, the short version from what I've read and what I've heard, and their music's cool. It's just good, straight up sleazy rock. Um, but from what I've heard and read, the the main guy, and I can't remember if he plays guitar or bass, I forget. Uh, he's basically just, he has a shit ton of money, and he just keeps throwing musicians together, and he'll go out on the road for four or five months, put out a record, and then he'll get new musicians and do it again. Kind of cool. Oh, wow. That sounds um, dope. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool stuff. So besides Louisville and San Antonio... Were there any cities that you wish that would have been on that, that tour? Not really. I, I didn't. I didn't have any. Oh, I hope we. Oh, I hope we. Oh, I, I, that never crossed my mind. I just looked at the thing and I went, "All right, eight states or whatever the hell it is, including drive time and all that, in two countries and six shows in ten days. Fuck it, let's do it." Because a lot of times, like I would tell people, "Oh, we did six shows." Oh, well, that's nothing. Once, well, you know how many states we went to, and I technically went to two countries because I went to Canada and I did all that shit in ten days, and then came home. Hold on, I want to know what kind of an asshole looks you dead in the fucking face when you're excited about that and says six shows is nothing. And if they're listening right now, uh, feel free to eat a bag of dicks. <laughs> Because that is some <laughs> fucked up shit to say to somebody. <laughs> Friend or not, that's fucked up, man. Steve, you've listened to my show enough so you know how I feel about things. Uh, it's 2019 and everybody's a fucking critic. Am I right? I yes, it I is am. 2019. You are correct. Now, no, fuck off, you dish. <laughs> were there any opening bands on this tour or was it just you guys? How did that work? Uh, there was one show in Canada... Uh, I'm drawing a blank on the fucking venue. The second venue was the Rockstar Music Hall. The first venue was... Oh, shit, I can't remember. But the first show we did in Canada, there were two opening bands. Other than oh, that, we were the only band on the bill. Do you have any idea why it was just that show that had two openers? I think it's because it was a smaller market, so they put two local bands to open for us. But that's really the only... That's the only speculation I have. I, I will be 100% honest with you because most of my Louisville people know this, and I think you know this. 
the bands that I'm in now, or I should say my main band, the swerve, um, I run that band and I do all the business and I handle all that shit. And I did the same thing for gas money and blah, blah, blah. And I don't mean that in a arrogant or shitty way. I mean, I just, I handle all the business. Everything's in my name, blah, blah, barf. The reason I say that is because when I got the tour with Delano, once I figured out what songs we were doing and all that shit, all I had to do was JPD, which is just play drums. There were questions I didn't fucking ask other than what time do we, do I need to be there in case I leave the venue? And uh, that's pretty much it. Oh, do we get food and is there coffee there? <laughs> so for a lot of it, you are on a need to care basis? Pretty much. Yeah, nice. and a lot of that shit I didn't really, I mean, it wasn't, it's been a long time since I've just got to play drums and not have to make any decisions. Not have to go get paid or renegotiate a contract or make sure they have all my tax ID information or all that bullshit. Do you, do you have the name of the business? Do I, I didn't have to do any of that. Um, Delana and Petra, mostly Petra handled all that shit. So when we were done, I just started breaking my drums down while everybody wanted to talk to Delana and get autographs and pictures and shit. It was fucking cool. Wow. That sounds awesome. It sounds sort of, um, I mean, considering, you know, gas money lasted a while and that was a lot of responsibility and pressure and, you know, doing that with the swerve, you know, that's again, more pressure and whatnot and responsibility. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it sounds like it was a really cool experience to just be able to, you know, like you say, JPD and then yep. move on. Yeah, it, it, it was. And it's, and it's not a slight on either side of it. No, of course being, not. Yeah. Being, a, not having a, a say in anything or having a lot of say in everything. It's not a slight on either side. It was just kind of cool to be able to do that for a few days and just go, Hey, I'm just fucking here to play drums. And I think sometimes I feel that my playing is a little bit better when I'm in that role because I don't have shit to worry about except my drums. That's it. All right. I need I was to know is say, it sounds like a, a bit of artistic freedom to not have the business side of it all weighing yes, down on you. It is. And especially with, with her tunes, uh, because the artist that wrote them is singing them in front of me. So I not only have to do the songs justice, I have to make her happy at the same time, which is two different things. Some people don't, um, and I don't say this in a shitty way, some people don't know how to separate the two. You can play exactly what's on the record, but you may have a night where your artist, in this case for me, Delana, where she doesn't want me to play exactly what's on the record. She wants me to do this and take a ride on the interstate and hang out at a coffee shop for a minute in the middle of the song. So you need to be able to have that communication with whoever hires you. And, and thankfully for me, I was able to do that with her. Kick ass. Were there any standout, like uh, of the six, was there one particular show that stands out the most in your memory? I know you have a shitty memory, so this might be a tough question. <laughs> I hate your fucking face. <laughs> um, actually, the two shows that stood out the most, smart ass, were uh, Sandy Hook, Wisconsin, and I'm sorry, it's Hazel Green, Wisconsin. The venue was the Sandy Hook Tavern. And the last show, which was the Richmond, Indiana show, the Sandy Hook show stood out because it was it was a weird little venue. It's a very small bar, but they've got kind of this outdoor, um, I will call it a mini amphitheater because it's not really an amphitheater, but it's set up like an amphitheater, kind of the 45-degree uh, angle awning, big concrete pad, huge PA, uh, lots of production. And there was a lot of people that showed up. And it was really cool because Delana had been there before, but she hadn't been there in, I don't know, five or six years, whatever it was. So you had all these, quote, repeat people that came out. And I got to meet a lot of people that had been following Delana for years, and they wanted to come and talk to me and uh, Steve and Ben because we were like, well, we've never seen her with you guys. And we're the smart-ass side of us is like, yeah, no shit. It was we we didn't know we were going to be playing with her until about two months ago. Um, but jokes aside, it, that was really cool because everybody that we came in contact with, including the club owner, super nice people, super respectful, super into what she does and what we were doing in the moment. And it was really cool to see massive fans of an artist uh, that it not only accepted what we were doing at the moment, but accepted us as being, hey, your players with our our girl or, or our artist or whatever you want to call it. Um, and that was, that part was really, really cool. All the shows were pretty neat. Um, that's right. I said neat, but that one sticks out. And then the Richmond show sticks out because it was the last show of the tour. And by the last show we were, the four of us were so 
fucking tight. You couldn't drive a pin between us with a jackhammer. I mean, when we were the starts and the stops, everything was damn near perfect on stage. And I mean, tight as in musically. Um, I mean, you would think we had been together for years and we'd only been together for a week or two weeks, whatever it was. And we were scheduled. I think our, we were contracted to play an hour and a half or whatever. And we ended up playing three hours because uh, it was the last night of the tour and it was sold out and it was just a fucking great show. And we, we had made a uh, Delana this actually Stacy had made it and brought it up to Richmond for me. There's a picture that somebody took. I don't remember who took it for us, but there's a picture of all of us standing on the beach when we were up in Ontario or not Ontario. I'm sorry. Yo, it was, it was grand bend Ontario. Oh, thank you. Well, you're, thank you. My memory. Um, so we took that picture and we had that picture blown up on a poster or like on a banner. And then we all signed the banner and wrote a little note to Delana, something she could take back to Holland with her. Um, so we, we, after we got done with the show and everybody left and got pictures with Delana and stuff, we went upstairs to the upstage and we had that laying on the floor for her. And it was a really cool moment. So those, those two shows stick out the most. That's kick ass. So you said that by the end of the, the, by the last show, you guys were super, super tight, like you had been playing forever. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's because all of you are seasoned, professional, know-what-the-fuck-you're-doing musicians, and so there was a lot, a lot less of a learning curve? Um, that's a good question. It's it's partly that. That has a lot to do with it. Um, I, don't really, I was going to say it's like a 50-50 thing, but you can't really put a number on it because... Steve, Ben, and myself are, I mean, we work great together, but as far as our mental approaches to music, we're, we're a little bit, we're all three a little bit different. Um, but that is a big part of it, yes. The other part of it is all of us are fans of her music. So we've, especially Steve and I, Ben, Ben's a little younger than all of us. So he kind of missed the whole, when she was on Rockstar, when she was on TV, he kind of missed that whole boat, so to speak. So, there was a little bit of a learning curve at first for him, but he got over that learning curve before we ever got in a room together. Uh, once he figured out who she was and all that kind of stuff. But Steve and I have been fans of her since she was on TV. So I think that played a lot into it as well, because not only were we fans and loved her music and all that kind of stuff and loved her as an artist, but because of that, we respected the music more than we would if we were just going in to do 30 covers or whatever. Not that there's not that you don't respect anything, but there's just a fine line of, yeah, I've got this song down or yes, I have this song down to the fucking minute note that nobody can even hear. Does that make sense? Yeah, it okay. does. So I uh, think that's that those two things, those two factors to answer your question, the, the professionalism and we've been doing it for a while and the respect of her as an artist and her music. Gotcha. Now I asked you about, you know, your, any shows that stand out, were there any non show events that stood out? I mean, obviously, you know, grand band Ontario was pretty fucking cool and it was beautiful and stuff, but was there anything along the way, you know, that stands out either maybe a landmark or scenery or, um, or maybe just something ridiculous happened in the van or something. Um, there was all kinds of little moments. I remember when we got closer to, uh, I might have been on the way out of Wisconsin. It doesn't matter. In the upper Midwest, those big fucking windmills, I'd never seen those in person. You see them on TV and shit, but God damn, those motherfuckers are huge. Wait, what are you giant, talking about? The big giant three-bladed windmills for the energy. Oh, uh, oh yeah. I forget gotcha. what they're called. They have a specific name because I had to Google them because I'm a fucking nerd like that. Um so you've but never seen those before? Not in person. I knew what they were, and I've seen them on TV and in movies and in pictures and shit, but I've never seen one in person. And when you're, you're always, on the— you ever, like, driven past one or yeah, whatever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when you're on the interstate and you look over, those motherfuckers are huge. So here in San Antonio, um, I guess they, they build them somewhere in Texas mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. because— uh, um, on I-10 and 64. Well, anyway, uh, it, on the highways around here— you see the pieces of them all the time on trucks. Oh, nice! And, and those blades oh, yeah. are are they're longer than a semi. Like it's an extra long trailer that's pulling these fucking things. And you know, there's three of them at a time, obviously driving down the road together. And 
they've got pilot cars and flag cars and all that other bullshit, but those things are fucking huge. We call them whale tails because they're just so goddamn big when you're oh, yeah. next to it in traffic. They're crazy. Yeah, they're they're those things are giant. Um and they're all over in the upper Midwest. Uh that was kind of cool. And I mean there was a lot of little moments where we all obviously bonded as as people. I think the post I wrote when I got back from the tour is we left as acquaintances and returned as family and I wasn't being facetious by saying that. Um I mean when you're in a van together for 10 days with five or six other people, uh you have two choices. You can either fucking kill each other or bond and we obviously and thankfully bonded um but the windmill thing was kind of cool when we got to when we were in canada we had uh, i don't remember if it was a day or two days in between shows the first canada show and the second i think it was two days yeah it was two days because we stayed at the cabin for two days but on the second day we went to um there was this little i shouldn't say little but I don't know how big it would be, but on the water in Ontario where we were, and forgive me, I don't know the actual river or and or lake that separates USA and Canada in that spot. But on one side of the water where we were, we were in Canada, and on the other side was is Detroit. Um, and I took a bunch of pictures of that, but we did a photo shoot uh, with a Canadian photographer who's a friend of Delano's. We did this kind of carnival photo shoot. I think I posted a couple of those pictures. I don't remember uh, if I posted them or not, but that was a lot of fun because we kind of put on stage gear and then we're walking around this carnival, this like street fair carnival thing, doing a photo shoot and uh, we're in Canada and right across the Bay is Detroit. So that, that was kind of fun. We had a lot of fun doing that. We got some really great shots too. Nice. That's dope. Um, yeah, I think it was like Lake St. Clair or anchor Bay or some shit like that. I think yeah, it was uh, anchor Bay sounds more familiar. It was something like that. Gotcha. Um, anyway, well, that's dope. So I know that you had a great time playing with all these, these cats. Mm -hmm. And I know that Delana lives on the other side of the planet. (laughs) So, so as far as Ben and Steve, do you see a scenario or, um, an opportunity that might come up where you, you three would get together and play again? Yes. Uh, we have actually been talking about that. We've been trying to work on, uh, times and in, in schedules and honestly just figuring out what we want to do. Um, but we, Steve, Ben and I, uh, we actually talk at least once a week. Eh, okay. Once every other week. Um, so one of us will message the other two cause we're in the, we're all in a, a group chat together, just the three of us. Um, and we'll throw out ideas and this, that, and the other. It's hard with their schedule. It's not about where they live. Uh, that has nothing to do with it. it their schedule, Steve and Ben are both in two or three bands a piece. Um, I'm in a couple of, well, I got my main band, the swerve, and then I do some stuff with the naked karate girls and I do fill in stuff, but I also, uh, I think you already know this, um, and most of my little people do. I've also started working a, a part-time job. So it's a scheduling thing more than anything. We've got 147 fucking ideas of what we want to do and or could do. Uh, narrowing it down is actually easier said than done, but it's a lot of it's narrowing down what we want to do and how we want to do it. But the biggest thing is just scheduling um, because, like I said, we, they have so much stuff going on and I have so much stuff going on. And that's a long answer to your question, but yes, Steve, Ben, and myself will play together at some point, hopefully very soon. Kick ass. That's what I wanted to hear. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah those, without any... Dude, they're awesome. I fucking love those guys. Well, the episode that you had both of them on, uh, the episode of Bar Star with those two dudes, um, y'all seemed like y'all really, really got along well. And that y'all weren't even done with your practicing by then. I mean, I think maybe y'all had practiced twice. At yeah, I think point. that was yeah, I think that was after the second one. I don't you know me, I don't remember. Um but that I think it seems I to be my recollection. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was after the second rehearsal we did. In fact I know it was because I had uh I was so nervous as they were about the first initial time we got together. Um because like I said, I mean it, it's or maybe I didn't say it, I might have said it on one of my episodes, it doesn't matter. Um it's not just the nerves of meeting new musicians that, cause that usually doesn't bother guys like myself or Steve or Ben that have been doing this for a hundred fucking years. It's more about, okay, I'm going to go meet a complete stranger to go tour with an artist that I've been a fan of 
and go out on the road with and do a bunch of shows, this is going to be fucking weird. So there's going to be nerves involved. And I think that had a lot to do with why the first rehearsal was kind of a little wonky. So I remember saving the podcast thing for the second rehearsal. Gotcha. So, like I said, I know that Delano lives in Denmark. Do, do, mm-hmm. Without any spoilers, I guess. Do you see an occasion where you got you the four of you might do it again? Uh, I've talked about it on the show. There is talks of, and I don't know if it will happen. Not because of anything good, bad, or indifferent, just because of fucking life. Uh, there are talks of doing another one next summer, going out for about a month, maybe a month and a half. Um, and hitting some festivals and or kind of a like a run we did this past June. Um, so there are talks of it. I don't know if it will or will not happen. Obviously, I want it to happen, as do Steve and Ben. Uh, so we'll just have to wait and see uh, if it can all come together. But yes, Come to the, ACL, the man. Huh? Come to ACL. Come to Austin City Limits. Uh, or South by Southwest or whatever the fuck. Yeah, I, I, dude, I don't know because uh, all that stuff, again, taking me out of the business equation, I don't handle any of that shit. Delana has a, a great team of people um, that handle a lot of stuff for, her, in fact, most of her stuff for. Her. Um, so that's going to be all up to them. So I have no, the only thing I really want, and it's because obviously I fucking live here. I really want a Louisville show. I bet. Um, I bet you do. Yeah. But other than that, I, I don't have, not only do I not have a say, but I don't really give a shit. Um, and I don't mean that in a disparaging way. If I'm going to go do, if I'm going to be out on the road for a month and a half, I don't fucking care where I go. Let's go. Right. I'm in. Yeah, that makes sense. So I know that you've toured with bands previous to this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I'm not looking for anything salacious or fucking weird, but is touring, <laughs> is, is touring with a female fronted band different than touring with a male fronted band or an all male band? Um, as far as Delana goes, no. And it's, she's the first female fronted band I've ever toured with. Um, but she's so, I, there's times where I don't even look at her as a her. And I don't, I don't mean that fucking politically correct shit that's going on right now. I look at her as a human. I mean, she's, she says what she thinks. She says what she feels. Um, she's just like one of us or her, her sense of humor is a little bit more twisted than mine, which makes me happy. Um, but no, there was really no different. No, or I couldn't see a difference from the, from the tours I'd done previous. That's a good answer. Um, I like hearing that. It seems like, um, at a certain level of professionalism, it doesn't fucking matter. And no, it does. It, it sounds like that's, that was the, the ingredient in that soup that was the four of you. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, we don't, obviously she's a, she's a woman. Um, but as I don't, I have never, I'm not that guy that goes, Oh, she's good for a girl. No, you're either a fucking amazing artist or you're not, not that, I mean, there's everything in between, but what I'm getting at is I don't ever look at that kind of shit. There's a drummer I'm into. Her name is, uh, I'm going to fuck it up because she's from Sweden. I think, uh, Anika Niles. It's Annika. Is it Annika? Yeah, it's Annika. Oh, thanks. Why are we You're welcome? I just made that up. I hate you. I do know her last name is pronounced New Lace. Point is, somebody uh, shot me one of her videos, I don't know, a couple of years ago and said, wow, this chick's pretty good for a girl. And I watched the video. In my immediate response, I didn't even get halfway through it. I said, this chick is good for a fucking human because she's better than most of us. And I don't, I don't look at Annika, Annika, however you say her name, as a girl. She happens to be a girl, but she's just a monster drummer. She's so fucking good. Same way with Delana. Yes, she's a female singer, but I, she's just, she's a badass fucking singer. She's an amazing artist. So that never came into play while we were on the road. Um, I know that earlier I told a possible bar star listener to uh, eat a bag of dicks. I want to say that to whoever says, <laughs> you know, X does, you know. This person does whatever for a girl. I, I think those people should be fucking shot. I don't think they should be shot. I think they should be kicked in the balls, though. No, no. I mean shot out of a goddamn cannon. Oh, I mean. Into yeah, a brick yeah. wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I'm in with that for sure. Now, again, I'm not looking for anything weird or salacious here either, but I know that, you know, rock and roll shows maybe in the past, there would be some, you know, ladies out in the audience who were more than willing to let the band know what 
what's under their shirt. <laughs> did that no. happen on this tour? <laughs> no. No, it did not. <laughs> I can't imagine a whole lot of ladies being like, woohoo, Delana, check out my boobs. She'd be like, yeah, I got some of those too. Dex, <laughs> moving on. Security. Security, <laughs> get this bitch out of here. No, it, it never happened. Good. That is fantastic. Can I have her hat? Uh, no, that hat is um, that hat has its own box. Oh, I'm fucking it should. Fuck yeah! And hopefully she's not careless like uh, Slash and just leaves it in the back of a fucking cab or whatever. Oh no, 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 no! No, we were all. Uh, it was actually really cool. Speaking of leaving shit around, it, it was. I only lost one thing on tour, by the way, which was I was pretty proud of. Um, but it was really cool because she. And I didn't never, ever, ever once even fucking dreamed of thinking of the question to ask her to help me. But she helped me every night with my gear, which I thought was fucking amazing. Her and I were kind of... Are you shitting me? No, I'm not. Her and I were kind of the the van planners. We figured out how to pack everything in the van because she was like, well, I'm good at packing. And I said, I'm really good at packing. And Y'all were the Tetris crew? Yeah, her and I were the Tetris crew because a lot of people don't know this. I drive a four-door car. I don't drive. I don't have a truck or an SUV or anything, and I can get my entire rig. Yes, my big giant drum kit. I can get that whole thing in my car. And when I told her that, she went, "Oh fuck yeah, you and I are gonna Tetris the shit out of this van." Because um, you got to think, there was five of us, so that's at least five suitcases, and then all of our gear, including my drum kit. So there's a lot well, of shit to stick know, not, in the van, and and also the bodies of five people. <laughs> Right. So her and I were Tetris in the shit out of the van. But the point is, is she helped me every night. She helped me unpack and pack my gear and put it in the van, which I thought was fucking amazing, which I thanked her for profusely every night and kept telling her, you don't have to do this. She goes, I know, but I like it. I said, but you really don't have to do it. She goes, I know, but I like it. That was always her answer. I know, but I like it. I said, you're a fucking freak. I love you. <laughs> I've never even heard of a singer doing that. Boy, girl, it doesn't matter. I know. I've never heard of that. <laughs> right. And much less somebody who, I mean, she has earned her place where she is. She doesn't have to fucking help me, and she totally did. I mean, we all helped each other, but it was just cool because I would, she would, I would roll my my hardware case in, and she'd open it up and start putting my stands together and shit. And she was like, "Which one goes where?" By the third show, she had it down and knew what went where, and it was fucking awesome. Wow. That is kick ass. Yeah, dude, it was it was really cool, and I because I have, um, especially when I travel far. Um, meaning I'm just not going up the street for a gig here home, here at home. I have a couple of extra bags that have a couple of extra pockets in case I either a break something and need to fix it later. I can put it in the empty pocket, blah, blah, blah. So I ended up putting a lot of her extra shit, like her tambourine and a couple of her tuners, um, and her, her mic. Cause she has a very, very cool mic. Do not even consider asking me the brand of it. Cause I don't know. I just know it was an awesome awesome microphone that was a gift uh had this really cool wooden case uh, but i kept her mic and all her cords i ended up putting all her shit in my extra pockets of the extra bags that i had so it was the way we kind of had everything down was really cool and then steve and ben took care of all her guitar gear so it was it was pretty neat i mean by the first show it was a little uh haphazard by the second show the next night i mean we had it down to a science it was it was really cool it came together really fast I'm really glad to hear that she brought her own mic. I can't tell you how many times I've either gone to see or listened to um, someone speaking into a microphone for various reasons, whether it's a fucking auction or a benefit or a live podcast or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they're using the club's mic. It's all beat to shit. It crackles. It just shuts off. You know, I mean, there's so many mic problems. I'm always like... This person does this for a living. Why don't they have their own fucking microphone? I mean, that's how they make their money. Why wouldn't they put that on themselves? So I think it's really, really cool that she brought her own mic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I I, I agree. I mean, there are some cases where it, it's just you're trying to do the bare minimum. Um, drummers, we always get shitted on that deal. But you're trying to do the bare minimum and you just want to show up, do your set, and get the fuck out. Um, that's where backline and all that stuff comes in. But yeah, I've, I've always thought the same thing. I'm like, why wouldn't a singer always have their own mic? So I don't know. I don't really have an answer to that because I'm not a fucking singer. So 
Well, that wasn't a question. I was just sort of venting my frustration on that. So no, 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 no. I wasn't saying that you were asking no, 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 a question. No, no, no. I'm saying I don't have the answer to that, but it's a question I've always wondered myself. I'm like, why the fuck doesn't that guy or girl have their own mic? I mean, but, it is pretty fucking weird. Yeah. I mean, you're uh, a drummer and you're you have your own mic. You're talking into right now. Hello. Doesn't doesn't count. Oh, nice. Don't, shit. Because you're a drummer. That makes sense. Now, we're. <laughs> Were there any mishaps? Like, did the van break down, or did you get a flat tire, or any nonsense? Or did anybody get homesick, or actually sick, or any shit like that? Uh, no. Nice. And no. No again, and nope. Now, again, feel free to not go into any detail at all. Uh, <laughs> three guys, two girls, traveling together, sometimes staying places together. What was the poo-poo protocol? Um, we didn't really have any pro poo poo protocol because everywhere we went, we had three rooms. Um, and it just kind of worked out this way. Uh, I, because I, Steve and Ben have been friends for 15 years or however long they've been friends. Petra and Delonis had their own room. Steve and Ben had their own room and I was alone in my own room. Oh, fucking fancy pants O'Reilly over here. I, listen, man, I, I, it wasn't, it just worked out that way. It wasn't any any kind of um, pulling rank or trying to be a douchebag, it just l literally worked out that way. Because like I said, Steve and Ben have been friends for so long. They're more comfortable with each other than me staying with one of them. You know what I'm saying? It just yeah. kind of worked out. Obviously, Petra and Delana are going to stay together. None of us are going to stay with her or vice versa. So it was just, I was the odd man out. So I got a room. I got my own room every night. That's kick ass. Oh yeah, it was I mean, awesome. I'm not complaining. Yeah. Trust me. Oh, yeah, I am bet. not complaining. Well, so, just a tip for everybody else who is in that situation who might not be able to have their own room. Every hotel has a lobby bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking fruitcake. Dude, I, I would go places with my wife and I'll be like, hey, I'm going to go get some coffee. Be right back. And then 20 minutes later, she's like, hey, you forgot my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> That's you know, funny. I didn't want to fucking blow up our room. That's what the lobby's for. <laughs> you're, you're a fucking idiot. I know. I'm terrible. Would you do it again? What? The tour? Yep. Oh, fuck yeah. I'd leave tomorrow. I'd leave tonight. Wow, to that's fucking lootly. That's short notice, man. Not only would I do it again and leave and tonight, go tomorrow. You're so, oh, I fucking hate you. <laughs> <laughs> you I, I know you only do this to make my editing sh job fucking miserable so i just cuss you the entire time i'm editing this show no i also do it to make you laugh ah who am i kidding i do it to make me laugh welcome uh, to fascination <laughs> street podcast <laughs> dick <laughs> not only would i would i do it again absolutely um but i had heard of this thing sometimes referred to as tour hangover i never really knew what it was um can you explain that? I've never heard of that. I'm I'm about to. If you don't shut well, the fuck up. Well, if you would fucking up. get to it already, Jesus. Shut the fuck up. Um, so do you because I remember I, what it is. Oh, you, you do realize that I can just fucking hang up on you and not finish the show. <laughs> oh, look, he got kind of quiet. Um, I had never really experienced it before, and and it's it's kind of a. It's not really a widely used term. A lot of people call it depression or whatever, or um, tour hangover, uh, tour blues, whatever. But when I came back, I got mildly depressed for about two weeks. Really? Yeah, I, I honestly did. Jokes aside, um, I was super fucking bummed that it was over. Uh, I wanted to be back out. Uh, I didn't want to get up and go to work. I didn't want to do any of that shit. I was just, I was really... I mean, it was a it was a mild depression for a couple of weeks. I mean, I was just, weeks. Yeah, it was about it was about two weeks. I was just a so, fucking mopey piece of shit. So the depression, the the hangover or whatever, it lasted longer than the actual tour. Yeah. <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit! Weirdly. <laughs> wow. But yeah, I mean, it was it was such a cool experience, and it was such an amazing thing for to do for me to get to do first of all, but um. And like I said, I mean, I've done tours and stuff before, but the tours I've done, um, I don't want to say that I wasn't invested, invested. I cannot talk today. 
um, because I obviously was invested, but it, there was just something about this one. And I guess going back to, to, to beat a dead horse, because I've been a fan of hers for so long, I'm going out with an artist that I'm a fan of and, and then I respect and all that kind of good jazz. Um, so when it was over, it was like, well, shit, it's over. That's it. Now I got to go back to, to normal life and I don't fucking want to. So I, I, it, it really bummed me out for about two weeks. Uh, it took me a couple of weeks to snap out of it. Well, I'm glad that you uh, answered that question that way because my next question was going to be what was coming home like? I mean, like knowing it was over, what was going through your mind as you rolled back into Kentucky or Louisville? Um, nothing in particular stands out that was going through my mind except don't fall asleep uh, because we we were going to stay in Richmond the night after the show or that night of the show. The last show was on Saturday, but the problem was – Delon and Petra's plane was leaving Louisville at like 11:30 a.m. Oh shit! So, yeah, so we drove from Richmond back here, which is uh, two and a half hours. It's not that big of a deal, but the way that we everything was routed, we got to uh, I think Cleveland is I think it was five hours, four hours, whatever the fuck it was, from Cleveland to Richmond. Got to Richmond, did the show, and of course, everybody forgets when the show's over, we have to break all the shit down, pack it all up, and get the fuck out of town. Um, so that takes a while. So I think we got back here at, I want to say, 6 in the morning. Um, slept for about four hours, got everybody up at 10 o'clock, and then I had to take them to the airport. There wasn't really much going through my mind other than I've got to get some sleep to get them to the airport on time. And then when we dropped them off, uh, Stacy and I dropped them off at the airport, uh, we came back here and I went right back to sleep. I slept till probably, I don't know, four o'clock that afternoon. And then I got up and I was okay. Uh, I was a little, it was, the house was quiet. So that was weird. Cause I had had five people, six counting Stacy. We were all in the house shooting the shit and laughing and telling stupid stories and all that kind of stuff. So the house was quiet when I woke up. So that was kind of weird, but it, it really hit me Monday morning when I had to get up and go to work. I went, motherfucker, I need to go to work today. I don't want to fucking go to work today. I'm, I need to be on the road. What I am meant to be on the road. I'm supposed to be playing. That's that's what kept going through my head. And that's when I got kind of, like I said, I had my little mini depression fit. Gotcha. Well, I did ask you if you would do it again, and you answered with the quickness that you would. Oh, fuck uh, yeah. Would you fly to Denmark to do it? Uh, if that ever came to fruition, yes. Uh, I would absolutely go to Holland. Um, but she, as far as Delana is concerned, I mean, she has her own band over there and her own um, kind of stardom over there. She's, she's well more known or more well known. Why the fuck can't I talk today? She is more Don't act well, like it's today. You right, you right. She is more <laughs> well known <laughs> in Holland than she is over here. Um, That's why I asked. Yeah, I know yeah. she's 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 popular here, but she's like way more popular over there. And I would assume oh, she plays a lot more over there. Yeah, she does. She plays all the time over there, and in her band over there, she's got a great band over there. Um, so I, yeah, I, I guess I, I didn't think about that part. She already has a drummer. Yeah. And, and this is, uh, um, nothing more than fact. There would be no reason for her to bring us over there because she has her own band over there. Right. Yeah. That uh, makes sense. But, but yes, if it ever came up or ever was a possibility, fuck yeah, I'd go in a heartbeat. Sweet. Do you plan on getting a tattoo to commemorate this amazing experience? Dude, that's a good question. Look at you with asking the fucking cool questions. That's two um, times I got you to say, that's a good question. Now, I know, right? You fucking, you're, you're kind of good at this. Maybe you should start a podcast or something. I'll think about it. I'll ask my wife what she thinks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I have thought about that, but I, I, it's, it's, it's nothing more than a, than a, a fleeting thought, so to speak. Um, for no other reason... I don't have a particular reason, I should say. It's it just I thought about it, and then I haven't really thought about it since. Um, but yes, it, I have thought about it. But if I actually put a whole lot of thought in it, I don't know what the fuck I would get. I don't know how I would com commemorate it. Get that it, hat. Get that hat tattooed on there. That's a good one. Get Delana's hat. Wow. Yeah, that's cool, right? Yeah. 
I know, right? Damn. Sometimes I got a good one or something. What was the hardest part? Of the whole experience? Yeah. I mean, and, and include, um, you know, from from when you met her all the way to when you got when you got home from dropping her off at the airport. What was the hardest part of all of that? You're stumping me today. Probably learning her stuff because it's it's kind of a twofold answer, um, two part answer. Learning her stuff because I approached it a different way. Normally, when I learn songs um, for any project I'm doing, I, I will t- I tend to chart stuff out, um, which is for the non musicians, it's basically a roadmap. There, there's full blown sheet music, and then there's charting. So think of charting as a way of shorthand. Um, and it just gives me a roadmap for songs, and then I can kind of ad lib here and there. Now, if it's something that has to be done note for note, like in this case, Delana's originals, uh, I would chart it out note for note. So it would be it would turn into full blown sheet music with a few things left out here and there because because it's for me, I, there's just things I don't need to write on there. Um, but I approached this one different because I had so much time between when the actual tour started and or sorry, when the actual offer came and I accepted it and the the tour physically started, there was so much time in between that I decided to not chart anything. I mean, it was the first time I've actually done it this way. So I didn't chart anything. I, I committed all her songs to memory. So I would, I would play with the, basically what I would do is I would play with, with the record or whatever tune I was working on at the time. I would play it to the, with the record and then I would try to play the whole thing without the record. And I would record it and go back and look at it and go, okay, I fucked that up. Okay, I, I came in wrong here. I did this wrong. So I was trying to, for lack of a better term, build it into my DNA where I didn't have to think about it as much, if that makes any sense to you. So that was one of the hardest things because I had never tried to do a project like that. Um, you were trying to sort of uh, you know, build muscle memory into it? Yeah, I was trying to build the muscle memory and build it into my DNA where I didn't have to think about it as much or I didn't have to refer to charts or anything like that. Um, so that made it hard. I, I And like I said, I chose to do it that way because I wanted to not have to think about my parts I wanted to think about everybody's part as a whole and I wanted to and selfishly I wanted to concentrate on her singing her tunes that I'm playing behind so that part was it was part selfish and the other part was if I don't if these are built into my DNA my muscle memory I don't have to think about them as much so the the window for error for fucking up is going to be less and less and less. If that makes any sense. A hundred percent. The the second part that was hard was, and it's because we didn't have, we only had the one rehearsal was learning to watch her movements. Um, and I think you've heard me talk about it on the show before. And it sounds funny because she's a girl, but I watch all my front people, I, whoever it is, I watch their ass or the back of their legs because it tells me where they're going to go. Um, so her being a girl, it's kind of funny, but it's not even remotely close to being that way. I had to figure out her body movements in the way she moves because a lot of people don't realize as far as physical stature, she's small. She is not a big woman. I mean, she's only like five, two, five, three, six, um, three with that hat, <laughs> six, three with the big top hat she wears sometimes, which she didn't bring that one with her. Um, so f- figuring out her movements and how she moves and navigates the stage, that was kind of hard just because there was not a whole lot of time to 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 prepare for that. And, and we really didn't – I really didn't get a whole grasp on it when we had the one rehearsal because she was – not only was she doing her part, but she was also kind of conducting us as far as where she wanted us to go and the things she wanted us to change, which the only stuff she really wanted us to change were things were – um, or there would be breakdowns in the middle of songs where she would talk to the crowd or whatever. So she wasn't changing quote unquote, what we were playing. Um, but that was the second hardest part was learning her movements. Cause I had time with Steve and Ben. I knew where after four rehearsals, we kind of figured out each other and knew where we were going to go and they could follow me and I could follow them. But like I said, we only had that four hour rehearsal with her. So figuring out her movements for me, uh, watching, 
quote unquote, the band leader and me being the train or the engine that drives the train, it was hard for me to, to figure out her movements and where she was going to go. took me a couple of shows. Um, by the third show I had it down and I kind of memorized all her movements and all her little ticks and quirks. And, um, so that was the, probably the second hardest thing. Nice. Very cool. Well, I appreciate you letting me take over your show and ask all these questions. Um, I have been dying to know the answers to these ever since, uh, ever since you went on tour, like ever since you <laughs> left for the tour, I've had these questions. Um, so thank you for that. And I know that your listeners will also have some of these questions answered. So I appreciate that. Yeah. I, I, well, thanks for wanting to do it. I, um, I, I appreciate that and I appreciate your interest. Yeah. It was kind of weird. I had a couple people when I released the, whatever episode it was where I vaguely talked about the tour, my phone blew up and they were like, dude, you didn't give any fucking details. I was like, ah, whatever. And I don't, I don't really have a reason for it. I, I think, uh, Sometimes I get in my own head, and I think that my my listeners get tired of hearing about the same shit. But then again, I mean, if they were tired of hearing about the same shit, they wouldn't listen to my show. So there you go. That's true. That's true. So now that that part is over, hey, what are you doing? Um, I'm sitting here in my star jammies and my star slippers. Because you're a fucking star. No. Wait a I minute. Don't. Does that mean you're shirtless? You Fuck no. Ugh, nobody wants to see that shit, dude. That's just fucking gross. Calm down, fella. Grody. Gross. So, are you done interviewing me? I am. Thank you for letting me cool. do that. Cool. Can we Thank get back to so my Thank you so much for show? taking the time to let us all get to know you a little bit better on oh, fuck the Bar off. Star Podcast. Fuck off. So, I got some questions for you, little mister. Oh, and just like that, I'm out of time. Thanks, buddy. Take it easy. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Jackass. So you told me a few times in conversation that your dad was a musician. Um, what did he play? In- I've never said that once. He played bass guitar. Well, he started off playing electric <laughs> guitar, and then at some point he got disgusted because I guess they would have uh, bass player issues right. uh, a lot, and so he just decided to learn how to play the bass, and he's been playing the bass now for the last... Goddamn, thirty years, I think. Nice. What what kind of stuff has he done? I mean, because you you've alluded to it, but you've never really given a whole lot of details. I mean, did he tour? Has he done originals, covers, the whole gamut? Okay, so info. so the name of the he was in a few different bands, but probably the most successful and the most memorable to me in in you know the course of my life with him. Um, it was a band called Sapphire, and it was spelled wrong: S A P H I R E. Okay. And um, there's not really ra- regional radio played down here because um, San Antonio acts like it's a big city. So they really only have, you know, the big shows or whatever. I mean, right. the big radio. Um, but for probably a few years, the local radio station, um, which just like every other city, KISS, right? So right. the local <laughs> KISS radio station on like Mondays at like fucking midnight or something, they would have one hour where they would play um, Texas artists, unsigned Texas artists. Right. And and that band Sapphire probably had three or four songs played on that particular uh, radio show. Oh, you know, over the course of a couple of years or something. Right. Um, they, they didn't tour really. Uh, they would play shows. They'd probably play four times a month. But, you know, back then it was a big bar scene here. So there was a lot of, you know, smaller clubs or bars or whatever. And so they would do that, you know, probably, like I said, probably four times a month. Um, you know, sometimes I guess occasionally it'd be six or seven, you know, it'd be a Friday and or Saturday. But usually it was, you know, just one day a, a weekend or whatever. But so they would practice on, I think, Sunday, and then they would, and they would practice like, I don't know, twelve hours. But <sighs> a lot of that, a lot of that practice was, let's go play three songs, and then let's go have a beer and smoke a joint, and then let's go back and play <laughs> three more songs, <laughs> and then let's go have a couple of beers and smoke a joint, and then talk about for some reason why the second set sounded worse. <laughs> 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 but they put out, um, I don't know. A, What's an EP? Like four? Is an EP four songs? Usually three or four, yeah. Okay, then they put out a full album. And when I say they put it out, I mean, they went into the studio back then. You know, it was 
uh, expensive studio time and all that shit. And then, you know, they had some uh, cassettes pressed. And then I think eventually they had some CDs pressed, but they would really just sell them at the shows. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't signed or anything like that. And what I would do besides get to hang out with my dad, because who doesn't want to do that, right? I mean, I, I know that kids today don't give a flying fuck what their parents do. Right. Um, you know, like movie stars and rock stars, their kids don't even give a shit. They're like, yeah, whatever. But <laughs> I, you know, I think I was probably like 10 or something when I started going to these shows with my dad to these bars. And he was a fucking rock star to me. So it was it was really a, a good opportunity for me to get to hang out with my rock star dad. And I started off, you know, I mean, I had to make myself useful. I couldn't just sit there like a fucking 10 year old. Because the rest of the band was like, what the fuck is this little kid doing here? So I made myself useful, and I, I was actually, my dad didn't have a whole lot of equipment, you know, but the drummer did. And so I, I made myself the drum tech, and so I would help the drummer, you know, uh, break down, set up, carry all of his shit around. And, um, you know, back then, big, huge cages were a thing, you know. Right. And so he had everything from like fucking roto toms. <laughs> <clears throat> he had roto toms. Gross. And, right. He had roto toms and he had, I don't know, fucking trees of all kinds of shit. And I mean, he just had more, way more drums than he could actually play. Right. Um, and so, you know, I, that's how I made myself useful was, you know, being a, being the drum tech. And then eventually, um, the guitarist was like, you know what? We need some lights. And so between him and my dad and me, we sort of set up a lighting rig and, you know, wired it to an old speaker cabinet. And then I had, you know, f toggle switches where I, w I would work the lights during the show. And so that was my job. Um, and that was so much fucking fun. But nice. so, so that's what it was. And, and it was, um, it was hard rock or heavy metal or whatever. And it was a lot of fun. And, you know, some of those songs, uh, uh, I still listen to it. As a matter of fact, the outro for my podcast, Fascination Street Podcast, um, on the way out, like as soon as the episode is over, you hear me talk over some music. And, you know, I say opening music by this person, right. closing music by this person. Well, that closing music that I'm talking over is my dad's band. Um, That's the band Sapphire. Oh, very cool. Yeah. I didn't know that. Very, very cool. Yeah, so, and I did it. I did, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I did that uh, sort of as a surprise for him, like an homage, you know, because mm -hmm. you know, I really love that band and it, it really meant a lot to me. And um, I tell you what, it was, oh, it's got to be a year, a year into my podcast before he let me know. Because I didn't tell him. I wanted it to be a secret. Also, if I'm being completely honest, it was sort of a sneaky way to, for me to find out if he was actually listening to my art. Um, <laughs> and it was about a year before he took such me. a manipulative so, little fuck. I'm a bitch, right? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it was about a year before he texted me. He was like, hey, you play my song. I was like, ah, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, Pop. Only took you a year. Thanks for noticing, fuck stick. But it was really funny because I didn't ask his permission. Well, hey, you got to do what you got to do. I mean, now, is that you know, with him being a musician? Is that where your love for music came from, or did yes. you? Okay, I've always, like I said, I've always, you know, just been uh, amazed by his ability. Because, I mean, he's sixty something now, so his voice isn't what it used to be. But when he was in his thirties and forties, um, he would sing Queen's Reich better than Queen's Reich, and he would sing Rush better than Rush. Um, I mean. I know you're not a huge Rush fan, but uh, he, I was yeah. just, my, my dad just, he blew me away. I was so enamored by his ability. And I can't carry a fucking tune in a bucket and I can't make a chord to save my life. I mean, I'm a pussy. It hurts my fucking fingers to try to play the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Ow, that hurts. I'm pushing too hard. Ow. So, <laughs> so since I can't do any of that, I just, love to listen to music uh all kinds of music and when i say all kinds of music i don't mean like other people when they go i listen to all kinds of music except this or except that no no i listen to everything i listen to reggae i listen to tejano i listen to world music fucking celtic music i listen to everything i love music well that's a good thing as you should love music 
Duh. You N- should love music. Oh, I fucking hate it. It's a bane in my existence. I'm just kidding. <laughs> You're funny. Now, did you ever... I know you said you you pseudo drum tech for a while, ran lights and all that kind of stuff. Did you ever tour with no, him? No, no, no. I never said pseudo. I was his drum tech. I, I never said you said pseudo. I said pseudo. I'll fucking punch you in the throat. Are you stealing my lines now? Yeah. I stole okay. your show. Why wouldn't I steal your fucking lines? You're right. You're right. So, like, like I said, they didn't really tour. So, I mean, they would play, you know, in and around the San Antonio area, and I would go to those shows with them, but there wasn't really a tour per se. Okay. Well, and what else? Getting... And also, they, there was never a formal, you know, how you take care of everything and the tax information and making sure everybody gets paid and setting up the gigs and all that yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah. There yeah. was no real formal entity. Like, that's why I was so impressed with the way you ran gas money and the way you're running uh, the swerve is that. You're treating it like a business, and um, that's one of the things I love about your show, the Bar Star Podcast, is that mm-hmm. um, you obviously have a shitload of musicians on your show, and mm-hmm. every single one of you talks about how you treat it like a business. Yeah, and all of the all of the time that I was around any band, not just my dad's band, but other local bands, they treated it like it was a hobby and it was a party. They didn't treat it like you know, this is a business. There are tax implications. There are pay implications. They didn't do any of that. Right. Well, it, it's, I don't know exactly when it was instilled in me and, or I figured it out, but I don't give a fuck when anybody says I don't, I, and you know me, I'm not a super argumentative person as far as getting in a massive pissing contest. I'll just tell you to fuck off and walk away. I don't care who wins because I'm just not going to waste my energy on that shit. But I will pretty much argue with almost anybody that says music is not a business or when you're trying to get to a higher level, the business plays into it. Um, If you want to just hang out with your buddies and and drink beer and smoke weed and play some tunes, then you don't have a goal. And that's okay. There's absolutely positively nothing wrong with that. Right. That's a hobby. Right. It's a hobby. But if you want to do something with it and get it out in front of people, the business aspect of it will always come into play no matter what the fuck you do. If you want to play in front of people at some point, there's going to be a business aspect to it. Now, how big the portion of business is depends on what you're trying to do. If you're in a gigging band like I am and you're just trying to play two or three times a month to some decent crowds and make a little bit of money, then yes, I still have to deal with the business, but I'm not dealing with things like, uh, uh, what am I looking for? What's the word here? I'm not dealing with things like artist rights and I'm not dealing with having to pay my publicist or having to pay my marketing person or having to pay this guy or that girl or this entity or that thing or pay, uh, for merch and all that stuff. But uh, at the same time, I have to pay the taxes. I have to 1099 the people that I pay out of my business account. I have to make sure that all the contracts are in line. I have to make sure that everything is agreed on. I have to make sure all that kind of stuff is there. And that's just to gig on the weekends in a cover band. So when you get to that higher level where you're a, I mean, I don't want to go super high like a Metallica or a Kiss, but I mean, that it, it it's all pretty much all the same. When you get to that level, the business side of it, is 90% of what you do. 10% is fucking playing because you have to think a band like a kiss or Metallica or even a Motley Crue, even though they don't play anymore, that's not a band at that point. They're so big. They're a fucking corporation period. That's true. Yeah. I mean yeah. the, the, the music and the, and the imagery and all that kind of stuff is a huge aspect of it, but it's still a fucking corporation. I mean, I, I get a, I get a kick out of, especially younger people. And I, I, I kind of, I'm really starting to feel like an old curmudgeon bastard. Get off my lawn! Um, but I, I get a kick out of the younger people that that just rag on like one hit wonders or shit like this. Or, um, well, this this guy had one fucking hit. He sucks. Or he only had two hit. He sucks. Well, if you had a hit 20 years ago, you could have been set for life if you handled the business aspect of it right. Um. For example, you've heard of of bands and or artists that are broke or whatever, like 
uh, the biggest one being MC Hammer. For a long time, MC Hammer was broke. How the fuck is that guy broke? Think about when Can't Touch This came out. That dude made millions off that song, and he was fucking broke. Why? Because he didn't handle it like a business. It's he a story as old as time. Willie yeah, Nelson. Absolutely. I mean, yep. Yeah. yeah. You didn't. You didn't have your business affairs and your business itself in order. You and left it up to somebody else, and yep. that person knew you weren't paying attention. Yep. Fuck you. Either that or, and I'm not being mean by saying this, you're just not business smart. I mean, if if what I do musically or even with my podcast, whatever, gets to a higher level, I'm smart enough to admit I'm not that smart and I'm going to get people to help me with it. Right now, right. I can manage it and I'm cool with it. But if it gets to a higher level or it gets a lot more busy or I have to bring people on, like I said earlier, like a publicist or a marketing person or whatever, I'm going to get somebody to help me because I'm not going to be able to, to handle that because I'm not smart enough. And it's okay to admit that. The problem is, is you get people and or artists and or bands that are not smart enough or they're not, they have too much pride to admit it. Oh, I can handle all this. Well, obviously you can't because you made millions of dollars and you're fucking broke. You fucked up somewhere along the way. And I think that's, I didn't mean to get off on this tangent, but I think that's why I've always, in most of the guys I've had on the show, like you said, that's why we've always approached it like a business. Um, listen, anybody that says, you if you make money playing music you're a sellout a fuck you b you're right i am you know why because i've busted my ass for 30 years to get good at my fucking instrument i don't at this point i don't do it for myself anymore if you can make money doing something that you love and doing something that you're good at what the fuck is the problem it's not my fault you hate your factory job or you hate your shit shoveling job that's your fucking fault. You go change your fucking life. I'm doing my thing. I've never understood that whole sellout thing either. And when I was a kid, I used to say the same thing till I really started to understand it. It's always amused me that you have the two sides to the to the story, like the MC Hammers or the the other people that are like, "Well, you you fucking sold out." Yeah, you damn right. Problem. You know what I mean? LG and E, baby. LG and E. Yep, you've heard me say it before. LG and E don't give a fuck where their money comes from. They just want their money. So if I wake up in the morning and I have a choice of play drums or go to work, and it's a legitimate choice. Right now, I don't have that choice. I have to go to work. Um, and it'll come around again where I get to wake up and have that choice because I've done it before. It's cyclical. Everything's cyclical. Um, I'm going to choose drums every fucking time. It's it's really not that difficult of a of a question. Sorry. Well, I think that, um, you know, with those people who are co complaining and pointing the finger about sellouts, look, uh, it's not my fucking fault that you hate your job. I love my job. You know, we both have to bring in money. And if I love doing what I do to bring in money, that ain't my fucking fault. Right. Fuck you. Go hate your job and shut <laughs> the fuck up. Right. I, I've never understood it. And, and I think a lot of it just comes from jealousy. It's it's 100% jealousy. I mean, the, the doctor that makes... $300,000 a year, he went to school and he paid his student loans and he got really good at what he does and he makes money. What's the difference between that and a musician who either went to school and or took lessons and or just practiced their fucking ass off for, for years and years and years? They should make money at their craft as well. Well, look, a skill is a skill. I mean, absolutely. You know, like I take my car to go get the whatever the alternator replaced they're not doing it for free nope. they have a skill and they're being paid for their time and their talent so yep. what's the fucking difference yeah there's no difference T to me there's no difference there never has been i shouldn't say never as i got older i started and i started to see it and start to understand it from that point on there never has been when i was younger yeah i was like oh, i gonna fucking play some music <laughs> we're gonna be huge <laughs> well obviously that didn't happen but there's still you can still make a comfortable living playing music you don't have to be a, a quote-unquote megastar which that shit doesn't happen anymore anyway you've heard me talk about that before yep uh it's it's the same way with other like i i've interviewed a ton of actors who nobody's ever heard of but that's been their sole source of supporting their family for decades yeah, and they probably make a great fucking living at it. They do make a great living at it. I, I interviewed a guy a couple of weeks ago. Nobody knows his name. He's been in over 150 things, and he lives next door to John Goodman. I, I would say he's doing all right. Right? 
I mean, he's he's doing just fine. He's been able to take care of his family for, like I said, decades. He lives in a nice neighborhood next to really cool people, and he gets to work all the time doing what he loves. If if you don't know his name, who he doesn't give a shit. He's making money. He's doing what he loves to do to earn that money, and he has a great life. Right. Uh, yeah, it's it's the jealousy, and of course social media and the internet fuel the fire but the the jealousy train is is just become a jealousy continent at this point it's i don't i don't get it and i don't understand it It, it's like um i won't go into too many personal details but you and i have had text conversations with things we're frustrated with and and i texted you the other day about uh uh, um jake brennan and the disgrace land podcast that's a great fucking show it's not even that it's a new show. It's not even that old. And that fucker just hit 20 million downloads. I 36 mad at episodes. Yeah, 30. Thank you. 36 I'm episodes. I'm not mad. I'm jealous like a motherfucker, but I'm not mad. <laughs> I'm not jealous or mad. I look at it and go, me, I wish that was me. But at the same time, that's it. That's the, that's the entire thought process I have. Good for him, man. Fucking keep kicking ass. Where you'll have the other... 47% of people that are into that kind of shit and go, fuck him, what's he done to deserve that? Fuck him, his show's not even that good. Fuck that guy. What's Where does that even come from? You know what I mean? It's that whole jealousy continent. Where, where does that even come from? I ain't mad at that guy. I'm not jealous of him. Good for him, man. Keep kicking ass. Oh, I'm jealous. I want that to be me. <laughs> I don't want to do all that fucking weird. Uh, I mean, that guy puts a lot of effort into his research and his production. Like He, oh, he does, does it right. Oh, he so does. he deserves to have all those the downloads. But at the same time, I don't want that many downloads. Well, I do too. But you get my point, though. I mean, we're not hating on the guy and throwing him under the 100%. bus and saying he sucks and all that shit. Fuck because he doesn't. Him. No, he doesn't. One, of the, but... one thing that I got from you, it might have even been before I actually ever spoke to you the first time, mm-hmm. and I've carried it with me uh, since, is you don't say things suck. You no. say it's not for me. Yeah, it's not for me. And if I vehemently I hate that. it, well, thank you. If I really, really hate it, I would tell you that I'd rather you kick me in the balls and have to deal with it. But I won't say anything sucks because there's something for everybody. There, there legitimately is. I mean, there's legions and legions and legions of fans for fucking punk death metal. I can't stand that shit, and I don't even know if it's a real thing. I just made it up off the top of my head. Let's say Norwegian death metal, because Jake Brennan did an episode or two about that. Mm-hmm, he did. Um, I used to kind of be into that stuff. I can't stand it anymore, but none of it sucks. Those guys are fucking talented musicians. It's just and, not for you. Yeah, it's just not for me. I, I stopped saying, and I don't really know where I picked that up from. I just know I've I've been like that for a long time, as long as I can remember. Um you know, you I, can do that with just about anything, I've learned. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Like, you uh, totally you're can. in Louisville. Papa John's Pizza is a big deal. Mm-hmm. It doesn't suck, but it's not for me. Right. Yeah, I'm not a... Stacy likes it more than I do. I'm not a huge fan of it. Oh, well, their garlic butter sauce is pretty good. Um, but I would never say it sucks. I wouldn't say that restaurant sucks or this restaurant sucks. I'm just like, ah, I've eaten there. Wasn't impressed. I'm not going to eat there again. And that... It's not for me. Yeah, it's not for me. Just go on about your day. I don't get the whole... I must spew hate and prove that I'm in a superior being than you. Fuck off with all that dumb shit. Now, I will say a person sucks. <laughs> I will do that. Dude, that you, suck as a, you suck as a human being. I need you to fucking just off yourself. Ouch. But that's reserved for... Taking that personal. I'm gonna I'm gonna edit that <laughs> clip out and just make that my ringer. <laughs> you should totally do that. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about when there's there's the whole uh, I was trying there was a, something in the news and you know I never watch the news but somebody did something on some social media site and got called out for it but it basically takes one person to to just spew so much hate and negativity and criticize everything and everybody for every reason you just you just, you know what you're a shitty sucky human being please go away that's what well, i mean by that i think recently there was some college kid who went to some i don't know football game or something that was going to be on tv and he held up a sign that said i just want beer money venmo me at and then he put his whatever his venmo name or something well it got on tv and then um 
all of a sudden he had something crazy like three quarters of a million dollars in his Venmo account. And he didn't know what to do with it. So, so he called his parents and his parents said, well, you said you wanted to buy beer, right? So buy yourself a case of beer and then give the rest to the local children's hospital. And that's what he did. So this kid who just happened upon three quarters of a million dollars, I mean, that number's plus or minus, he, right. he gave it away to a children's hospital. So naturally it made the news. It made the morning shows and the newspapers. But there was this newspaper, I don't remember which one, that they they did a story on him. And then at the very end of the story, they said, but we went ahead and researched this guy's tweets for the last three years. And he has said some derogatory things about some certain people. Like, why? And their defense was, oh, we have to do our due diligence or whatever. But did they? I mean, that was a feel-good story. Like, who gives a fuck what this guy said three years ago? He just gave all this money to a children's hospital that he didn't have to give. And so everybody was up in arms. Well, then guess what? The guy who wrote that article, somebody did a deep dive on his tweets and found out he said some shit, too. Oh, God. That's so fucking stupid. <laughs> Pretty rough. Yeah. I, I am a huge fan of comedians. You know this. And I watched this clip and they had a word for it. I don't remember what they called it or a phrase. It might have been cancellation culture or Yeah, it's called cancel culture. Cancel culture. Yes, 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 yes. And it was Bill Burr and a couple other comedians that I've I've never heard of, and I'm not slighting them. I've just never heard of them before and I can't remember their names, but Bill Bill Burr was going on the, going on about the whole cancel culture thing and he had a lot of good points and it's it's like really who who hasn't fucked up in their life? Move on. Before all this shit where you could track everything, just move the fuck on. Just let it go. It's it's such a waste of time, and it's so silly. It's not and, moving the ball forward. No, it's not. I forgot who posted it, but uh, this past weekend in Louisville was uh, the Bourbon and Beyond Festival. Had a bunch of bands on it, 30, 40 bands. This weekend is actually louder than life. Um, but it had a bunch of bands on it, and the Foo Fighters were headlining one of the nights. And Scott Ian's wife, Pearl, has a band called Pearl. They played on 4th Street Thursday night, and then Friday night they had, or vice versa, whatever, Friday or Saturday, it doesn't matter the day. The next night they were playing at Bourbon and Beyond. Um, well, Scott Ian is from Anthrax, and his him and Pearl have been together for a long time, and they have an 8-year-old son. And they're friends with Dave Grohl. So Dave Grohl actually pulled their son on stage with him to play uh, uh, Everlong on guitar. He's an eight-year-old guitar player, and he fucking nailed it. It was great. So they released it on YouTube. And then there's some schmuck from the Jersey Shore who got drunk or something that was released on YouTube around the same time. And there's this – it's either a website or a social media account. I can't remember. that it tracks weird things like that. And the the dumb schmuck from Jersey Shore had 254,000 views in two days or whatever it was. And the video of an eight-year-old playing guitar with the Foo Fighters in front of 40,000 people only had 54,000 views. Jesus. In two days. If that doesn't tell you... About that, where we're living? Yeah, that and that people are fucking stupid... There's an issue. <laughs> and that's not, by the way, kids who are listening to my show, because just so you all will know, that's not even political. That is simply a matter of observation. Yep. 100% agree. You ain't wrong, my brother. That's just fucking stupid. What is more impressive than an eight-year-old playing guitar with Dave Grohl in front of 40,000 people? Oh, uh, some drunk schmuck from the Jersey Shore saying something stupid? That's fucking, it's just lame. Well, at one point, we were enamored, enamored by... Easy for you to say. Clearly. At one <laughs> point, we were enamored with the talents of, you know, a young phenom like that, or we wouldn't have Justin Bieber. Now, again, you know, that music's not for everybody, but that little kid got discovered on YouTube, and mm -hmm. he, he has made, I don't know, half a billion dollars. So at one point, we did care about things like that, but now we care about some short guy with an attitude problem in a bagel shop in New York City. Right. Yeah, I don't 
I just don't get it. I think um, I honestly, and I've said this before, and I've had a couple people text me and get mad at me, but I don't care. I think people are getting more dumb by the day. People as a whole, that is. Well, a hundred percent. They're just people are just getting dumb. They don't. Nobody puts effort into anything. And it's oh, look what I found on Twitter. <laughs> look at watch this guy. Oh, look at that. Really? You just wasted a minute of my life. I'm never going to get back. I need you to go fuck yourself. Yeah. Sideways with rusty objects. <laughs> How did we get on this? We've de- we've made the show depressing. <laughs> I know, right? Now I'm all sad. I want to slip my own wrists now. Thanks, man. I'm going to call uh, your wife. <laughs> what are you going to call her? 911. <laughs> wow. This <laughs> fucking douchebag just texted me. Yeah, tell him to eat a bag of groceries. Eat a bag of groceries. All right, I only have one last question for you, and then I'm letting you go. All I right, have to go hey, deal with this douchebag that texted me. Hey, it's your show, man. I got all day. <laughs> <laughs> Breaking news. The douchebag that texted me is the douchebag I'm talking about. Um, talking to. That's what I said. Talking about. Easy for me to. A boot. A. Eh? I did go to Canada. Um, my biggest, qu- my last question for you is, what made you decide to start a podcast? I have been listening to podcasts. Um, now it's been like fifteen years. Um, I was listening to podcasts before there was even an iTunes. Well, I'm sorry, before podcasts were on iTunes, I was listening to them. Right. Um, And they always entertained me. I was working in a bank, and it was not customer-facing, you know? So I didn't have to talk to... I mean, I did talk to people. I was... Actually, I asked you this question last time you were on my show. As soon as you said the bank, I remembered. Oh, okay, gotcha. Because you and your buddy were going to do it together, and then he moved, and you ended up doing it by yourself. Actually, I moved, and he ended up doing it by himself. <sighs> I was close. I, I moved off. to Louisville, and he did it, and then Fuck I would off. call I in was sometimes. Yeah, yeah, but I, what happened was I had the opportunity to go to Los what Angeles was. for a visit, and I was going to meet some people that I had been talking to um, various other ways, sort of like how you and I have been talking for fucking a year and a half and we've never met right i was going to la and i was going to actually be face to face with a bunch of these people and i felt like it was a great opportunity to um to have them on the show because by that time his show had sort of morphed into our show and i was booking guests on it and things right and i said hey man i'm gonna interview all these people you know, for the show. And he was like, well, I'm not going to be there. And I go, uh, okay. And he goes, so they're not going to be on my fucking show. And I was like, mm, uh, all right, so I'll just start my own show. And then he got his feelings hurt and I didn't talk to him for a year and a half. And there you have it. And also he stopped doing his show. So. <laughs> <laughs> he stopped doing his show. I mean, you know, and I don't mean this in a brag. I actually do. I do mean this in a braggy way. Um, what I have done with my show, I could have done with that other show. You know, like this show, my show wouldn't exist. We could have done his show, and I could have brought all of those those people and all those experiences and all of that help. And um, you know, he didn't want that. So there, there we go. And I mean, like I said, we didn't talk for a year and a half and we do talk now, but it's so, so so seldom. Like, it's not what it was. I mean, we were like best friends for 10 years, 12 years, something like that. And, you know, he got, he got butthurt over that. And then now we're really not friends. I mean, we're, I guess we're okay, but we're not like we used to be. No, I get that. Am I keeping all that? You can, if you want to, I was whatever, man. I didn't use any names. Well, fair enough. All right, man. Well, you got anything else you want to ask me before I let you go? Yes. Since you took over my fucking show? Yes. So the, I always like to end my show with one question for the guests. Mm-hmm. Are you still hung like a fire ant? Oh, my God. I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> what?
What episode did I say that on? I don't even remember. <laughs> you said it on a couple. You did not hang up, you fucking prick. <laughs> Stop texting me, you <laughs> weirdo. <laughs> Bye. Later, man. Well, that's it, kids. That's the show for the year. Not even the week, because I haven't posted one in 12 weeks, 14 weeks, 17 weeks. I don't know. That is the show for the year. Uh, thank you guys that have stuck with me through this journey. Thank you guys for your patience. Uh, thank you, Steve, for taking over my show and making me laugh. I had a good time. He is a good dude. Like I said, make sure you check out his show, find his show, Fascination Street Podcast. Uh, I believe his website is fascinationstreetpod.com. My website is gone. I do not have one anymore. So find me where you can on social media, on uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, what the fuck ever you want to find me on. I am out there somewhere. Check out my YouTube channel, all that kind of shit. Get a hold of me wherever you want. I still have the email address, uh, barstarpodcast at gmail.com, which is uh, a ghost town. None of you email me. I wouldn't email me either. I, I totally get it. But I hope everybody had a Merry Christmas yesterday, if you're listening to this on post day. If you're not, I still hope you had a Merry Christmas. And I hope you guys have a fantastic new year. Don't do anything stupid. Don't get DUIs. Don't get locked up. And to all my Louisville and around the country, if you're a band person or a musician listening and you are playing on New Year's Eve, please be careful. May you make shit piles of money. And uh, that's it. That's all I got. And as I say at the end of every episode and for the last time in 2019, <gasps> go do some shit. Seriously, beat it. I got shit to do. Obviously, I have a lot of shit to do. Couldn't tell you when the next episode's coming out. It will be out sometime in 2020. Oh, look at that. A dad joke. I'm out. I love you guys. Thanks for all your patience and thanks for following me and continuing to check out the show and for all your support and uh those of your faces that I know, I love your faces. Those of your faces I've never seen, I love your ghost faces. Man, just don't fucking do some shit. <laughs>